And welcome to this edition of the Native News Update on this Monday, October 29th. I am your host for today's program, Paul Domain. And many of the stories right here can also be found at our website at IndianCountryNews.com. And here are some of those news stories from the day. Tribal casinos and offices are closed along with the rest of the East Coast as Hurricane Sandy heads inland this evening. With the storm 100 or more miles out, emergency actions were being taken from Nova Scotia to the north through North Carolina on the south, down through the East Coast through Massachusetts and Connecticut where patrons and guests at the Mashantucket Pequot Casino were being consolidated into one hotel and south through New York, Delaware, New Jersey. Impacted by the direct path of Sandy will be the Narragansett, the Wampanoag, the Mohegan, the Pequot, and the Shinnecoke of Long Island. The Shinnecoke, who are less than a mile inland from the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, had already evacuated many of its residents by early October 29th. The boardwalks and streets of Atlantic City, New Jersey, and high tide in New York City at Battery Park in Manhattan already had some of those areas underwater early this afternoon with the eye of the storm still several hours away out to sea. Also impacted will be the tribes to the south associated with the United South and Eastern tribes that run from south of New Jersey and New York along the coastline there down into the Gulf Coast tribes. Those tribes have weathered past hurricanes and are providing advice to other tribes through the Tribal Emergency Management Association have put crews on alert as well. One of the big differences from the Gulf hurricanes, this storm is producing blizzard-like conditions on its southwest edge that is expected to dump a couple of feet of wet snow during 60 to 70 mile an hour winds tonight in several states at higher elevations. The storm, which will move directly west into the United States from its entry into the New Jersey region today, has already produced hours of deadly winds of 60 to 7 miles an hour, drenching rain and floods, as well as a huge surge of water impact in the East Coast. Even the western and southern coast of the Great Lakes by tomorrow morning may be experienced 40 to 50 mile an hour inland winds and 25 foot waves as far inland as Chicago, Illinois, by Tuesday, October 30th. Three years ago, the United States Supreme Court warned that there would be constitutional problems with a landmark civil rights law that has opened voting booths to millions of African Americans and other minorities in the United States. Now opponents of a key part of the Voting Rights Act are asking the High Court to finish off that provision. Some of the governments uh, covered, most of them are in the South, argue they have turned away from racial discrimination over the years. But Congress and lower courts that have looked at recent challenges to the law concluded that a history of discrimination and more recent efforts to harm minority voters justify continuing federal oversight. The Supreme Court's could say as early as October 29th, whether it will consider ending the Voting Rights Act's advance approval requirement that has been held up by, uh, held up as a crown jewel of the civil rights era. The basic question is whether the state and local governments that once boasted of their racial discrimination still can be forced in the 21st century to get federal permission before making changes in the way they hold elections. The advanced approval or pre-clearance requirement was adopted in the Voting Rights Act in 1965 to give federal officials a potent tool to defeat persistent efforts to keep blacks and other minorities from voting. Coverage has been triggered by past discrimination not only to blacks, but also against American Indians, Asian Americans, Alaska Natives, and Hispanics. And today we go to Southern uh, Illinois to talk with Robert Allen Warrior Osage about the latest in the politics of presidential politics. Thanks for joining with us, uh, Robert Allen Warrior, on the Native News Update today. And being a college professor, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's going on with colleges, students, and elections, because we're in pretty much the last eight days leading up to this presidential election. Want to know what the students are doing, how the college reacts, and what does a professor do when he's discussing this to great topic here? You know, I think that... First of all, thanks for having me on the show, uh, Paul. It's great to see you again. You know, I think that for uh, college professors, the challenge is always trying to 
find out where students are and trying to, to get them to think a little more seriously about what it means to participate or not participate in an electoral process. It's, uh, it reminds me of 20 years ago when I started as a college professor that there was a, a kind of a, a, a sense that students were really wanting to find ways into the process and that's still true for a lot of students, but I think that the general feeling that I get from students these days is that they're being left out and that they don't, that they don't necessarily feel like they want to fight their way in. And I think that that's a, a, a tough spot to be in. I think it's unfortunately a, a of it, it, it's a sign of larger currents out there in the world that, that seem to say that by not participating, uh, that, that, uh, that creates better opportunities for some candidates over others. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, do you think that tends to be a, a trendy thing during different times? For example, during the last 30 or 40 years that I've been participating in this political process, there seems to be an ebb and flow of college students and young people in campaigns off and on sort of a thing. Right, absolutely. And it does it does change over time and it can change pretty quickly from election to election. I remember uh, four years ago when I first came to the University of Illinois, there was a lot of excitement on campus and that may have had to do with the historic candidacy of, of President Obama. Uh, and I see now that that as things are more complicated and the choices are not so stark in some people's minds that they're made to seem more like kind of cookie cutter kind of issues as people see them in ads on TV and what seems to be a pretty negative kind of campaign, that it can be harder to just get the attention of, of students. Students have lots on their minds. They have lots of reasons why they, they uh, pay attention to different things. And I think that you've got to find ways to really capture them and capture their intelligence and uh, assume their intelligence as, as, as part of, of reaching out to them. Would it be, uh, they had a rally for Obama at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, two weeks ago, perhaps uh, 30,000 people showed up. Mm -hmm. We are a swing state. Right. Illinois, of course, uh, is about as blue as you can make the blue go. Right. Uh, do you think that perhaps is a little bit different where the value of the vote in relationship to the Electoral College makes a difference? Sure, I think for the presidential election, that's definitely the case. Illinois is really interesting. I think it's similar to Wisconsin in that the, the urban areas here, which is really just kind of East St. Louis and Chicago, those are deep blue kind of places. But then the rest of the state is pretty red, including where I live here in uh, Champaign County, where our, the university, uh, where the university is. And I think what's what's hard about all of all of the way that the presidential campaign runs things is that that attention attention then uh, uh, isn't nearly as high as it could be on some of the local races that that really have an impact upon uh, our, our local lives. Just yesterday afternoon, you know, a, a local candidate for a county auditor uh, stopped by my house to shake hands and say, "Hey, I'm running for county auditor. I hope that I can have your vote." And you know, I find that to be a, a really encouraging and impressive uh, that there are people out there who are participating at that level, not at the level of sound bites or, or commercials on TV, but who are really getting out there. And I think, Paul, that that's the connection. I think that's important to make for people in in our communities, in American Indian communities, the kind of questions we need to ask. I mean, there's always some there's always some uh, back and forth uh, this this uh, uh, this time in the campaign cycle that says, should we as American Indian people be participating in elections? Right. And I think that that's a, a, a fair question that people have different sorts of answers to depending on their political perspectives, perspectives that I like to respect. There are some people who say, I don't want to participate in American elections because I really don't feel as though I'm an American. Right. Uh, and, I, and I respect that for those people who feel that way strongly. There are other people who are very gung-ho about their connections to the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. They feel very much invested in the American political system, but I think it's important for all of us to think about to participate in the political life that's around us. And even if you don't want to vote for president, I'd say if you live someplace locally, I would hope that you'd at least consider strongly voting for mayor, voting for 
auditor voting for all of those offices of those people whose 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 lives impact you in the same way that it's important that that I think that we ask people to really seriously consider what it means to participate and not participate in their own tribal elections and their own tribal political processes beyond the electoral process. I'm coming down to uh, Evanston, Illinois on November 10th to make a presentation over there at the uh, Mitchell Museum of the Amer American Indian. And sure. my uh, talking points is uh, we're no longer the miner's canary. We are the tipping point, the balance mm -hmm. of power. For example, uh, there's a very, very close Senate race in Montana that may absolutely be judged by whether or not the indigenous community in Montana, which represents, I think, uh, six or seven percent of the vote, something out there compared right. to Wisconsin's 1.82 percent. But even Wisconsin is being looked at. The Obama and Romney campaigns uh, have identified 106 counties in the United States that are tipping points. Three of those counties are in northwestern Wisconsin, Burnett, Washburn, and Soria County. And Washburn and Soria County both have Ojibwe reservations that can tip the balance between political candidates. Right. So when the tribal members stand together, it seems to me that they're demanding to hear both from the Republicans and Democrats for a change. And the politicians are responding because of participation in the political process. Now, you said... There's people who don't want to vote because they don't consider themselves a citizen of the United States. They drive with a license issued by a state in the United States. They pay Social Security. They perhaps, uh, you know, I mean, I, I would look at those kinds of issues and saying, are you not exercising your rights as a sovereign entity and a citizen by not participating in that political process when you are a recipient of benefits? Can you argue that? Sure, and I guess what I'd, I'd like to see on that, I agree with all your points on that, Paul, and I guess what we need is a little bit more uh, a little bit more anguish in the way that we think about these issues to say we need to really think about ourselves as being in the crucible of American life. Uh, I like I like your your uh, tagline of saying maybe maybe thinking of ourselves as the miner's canary uh, is a bad idea. That we need to think about ourselves as participating and making a difference in the life of the world around us through the means that we can do that. I'm really concerned, whether it's in the cities, on the reservations, on the college campus, for the, all of the young people, but especially the American Indian young people who feel disenfranchised by the political processes that are around them. That can be true of tribal politics, and be true of local politics, national politics. The way that we make a difference in that is by digging in and participating and understanding issues that are involved, and understanding that being an American Indian person is a primary identity for many of us. It's the way that we filter and think through the issues that are around us, but the, it doesn't encompass everything that we care about. It may also be that other, uh, other issues uh, like uh, equity and access for all people, homelessness, uh, hunger, that these are things that, that surround us as people living in the world, things that I think as part of our traditional philosophies, oftentimes we're called on to help people in those ways that we think through those prisms as well as we think about who are the people that we're electing uh, to, to, to enact the policies, uh, to be our voice within these things. And I think that whether you think of yourself as a dual American citizen and that's what really gives you the sense of voting or that just because of the odd situation we're in as American Indian people, that, that we have the right whether we think we should have the right or not, or whether it's the right thing to have, we have the right to vote. I think that it means something, and it should mean something uh, to not exercise that franchise. Questions about history. Uh, being in Osage, mm -hmm. coming out of Oklahoma, boy, bright red in Oklahoma. Absolutely. Uh, tell me a little bit about the dynamics of bright red for even the native community in Oklahoma versus what uh, tends to be a typical pattern. For, for example, on the Menominee Indian Reservation in Wisconsin, when they turn out, it's, it's uh, you know 80% Democratic turnout. Let's talk about the history of Oklahoma and ask the question, do Native people feel like they have a seat at the table within the Democratic and Republican parties? You know, I think that it's a, it's a great question. Historically, 
Uh, the the uh, Indian people in uh, Oklahoma have been fairly split, uh, and I think that that's still the case. I think it's important to recognize in that sea of red the extent to which many, many American Indian people are, in fact, on the progressive side of things, tend to be progressive on various uh, sorts of issues. But there are important blocks of American Indian people in Oklahoma who, uh, who uh, have pretty conservative views, uh, who I remember somebody on a, a web forum that I see who uh, th that I read who you know said we are uh, Christians first, Americans second, and Osages third. Well, I tend to disagree with that particular ordering of the thing, especially as a non-Christian. Uh, but I, you know, I think that it's a it, it it's something that's out there. It's something that is part and parcel of who we are uh, as American Indian people uh, in Oklahoma, uh, and that that. Uh, um, for every person like that that I can think of, I can also think of people who have spent uh, an entire lifetime being involved in progressive uh, political uh, uh, causes. Uh, sometimes people have done that through the Democratic Party in Oklahoma and have been part of a, a part of a different story. One one quick uh, story in that regard, Paul, that it's kind of nonpartisan. The a couple of years ago in our uh, uh, tribal elections, uh, the Osage News that uh, that I helped serve as a member of the Osage, uh, Osage Nation editorial board uh, when I was on it, uh, we wanted to sponsor a, um, a candidates forum, you know, a debate. And what we did, as opposed to doing what is a typical kind of Osage debate, you could put a card table up on a stage and have people kind of argue with each other, uh, we called the League of Women Voters in, in uh, Tulsa. And they provided us all of their stuff, their microphones and their set and their rules for how you do a debate and how you moderate it. And I got to tell you, those debates were some of the best forums for thinking through issues uh, that I think Osage voters have ever had. I was really proud to have been involved in that effort because it really showed that we could both participate in the broader world to make tribal politics more meaningful and better. I uh, often look at the politics from my understanding from this point of view, and that is is that uh, the tribal communities, while voting Democratic, because my impression is is that American Indians feel welcome to the table of the Democrats along with the blacks and the Latinos and the Hispanics, uh, Hispanics and gays and lesbians and all, you know, worker, union workers and all kinds of odds and ends. And yet the community I work with is much more conservative. For example, I would say they're very much pro-life, and yet at the same time leave that choice up to an individual. They're very much supportive of the military. Some families having every single family member right. go through the military, and yet at the same time they would allow for someone to withdraw from military participation. Uh, smaller government tribal government with the relationship with federal government get rid of the townships the counties and the states a much more direct relationship and certainly a, a taxing at least in the in the past many reservations were pretty much void of tribal taxes being applied to citizens property taxes corporate taxes even though that's changing quite a bit the community as a whole seems much more fiscally militarily pro, uh, you know, abortion, uh, leaning against abortion in, in uh, that those conservative themes, but much more liberally, socially minded about how people act. Does that feel reasonable? I think it does. And I think there's a, a lot there about freedom and liberty that's really important. And, you know, I see part of that conservative streak in my own community being one that says, I want you to be free, including to make your own mistakes. And so that people uh, let people do their own thing, including uh, to the extent uh, to which they, they might end up in trouble because of it. And they say that's how you're going to learn uh, from your own mistakes. Uh, we're a week away from the, the passing of Russell Means, who uh, was a libertarian consistently across his life. And he said that that was something that was part and parcel of who he was as a Lakota person. And, you know, I really believe him. And I think that there's a way in which that's part of Russell Means' legacy politically uh, was, in fact, that embrace of that libertarian spirit, which in many ways does accurately describe exactly what you're talking about, of saying, my liberty and my freedom is actually more important than, than many other things that I might uh, want to impose upon others. And I think that that's a reflection of, of the, the best ideals of American Indian philosophies, American Indian cultural traditions, and other cultural traditions around the world as well. And, I, and I'm, 
I, I'm proud to to embrace many of those same ideals. You're saying in the long run, it might be that American Indians would make better libertarians than they would make Republicans or Democrats. You know, I think it's true because I think that what we need so much within the American Indian political world is that sense of independence, that, that, that independent thinking, that thinking for ourselves, that kind of self-reliance that says that there's so much more that we can do for ourselves that we ought to be doing for ourselves. Sure, we need to break down the barriers to opportunity and access, but at the same time, we also need to recognize within ourselves that, that spirit that, is, that, that, that we have available to us to make things happen. Uh, to to start things for ourselves, to not be waiting around for somebody to start a program, but to go out and embrace the future through our own volition, through our own will, and making things happen. Twelve years ago, a young woman at the time by the name of Winona LaDuke teamed up with Ralph Nader on the Green Party ticket. Uh, I ran her vice presidential campaign. Uh, Al Gore won the... Uh, popular vote. George Bush won the Electoral College based on 400 votes in Florida. There are people who called me up and says, it's your fault that George Bush got elected over Al Gore. I says, hang on a minute. Let me get my tape recorder. I want my grandchildren to hear that. <laughs> um, I says, unfortunately, the Nader LaDuke campaign could not take responsibility for giving uh, George Bush the race. It was the 445 conservative Miccosukee Seminoles who cast their vote for George Bush that gave him his edge in Florida. They, all, they were all hanging chads, by the way. <laughs> the tipping point, um, the native vote, uh, maybe it's so important that uh, uh, you could talk to your students and say we had one vice presidential uh, candidate, Charles Curtis, that was elected. We had a young woman who ran for vice president. I believe we might have had one or two other people dabble with it, uh, politics from time to time. Um, what's the importance of that? Just one vote split. You got a Democrat, you got, uh, you got two Democrats, two Republicans, and you got a tribal member who's got to make a decision. Balance of power. Right. And that's part of the reason why I maintain my independence as somebody who doesn't belong to either of those political parties, uh, because I don't want, in fact, to, to subscribe uh, to, to either of those ideologies. I have enough trouble with both of them. Uh, and I think that it's important to look at all the candidates. It's important to it's important to make up your own mind and not to make up your mind based on what might happen if I do this, what might happen if I do that. I think you make up your own mind. You decide what's important to you. Uh, I think that back in that election in uh, 2000, it was important for a lot of us to see that, that the, the NATO Leduc campaign embodied the ideals that we had. Uh, sometimes you do things because it's right, not because it is expedient. And you, you, you make the right choice because you're voting for the future, not just for the present. And you're trying to make a world that, that is, is changing itself into the world that you want to live in. And I'd like to live in a world that, that has more choices than I have right now. Uh, that's why I always look down the ballot and try to find those people who most reflect my values. Uh, if my vote's important to me, then it's important to think about, about casting it in a way that reflects my values. And I do that at tribal elections, and I do that as well in, in any other in any other election that I participate in. Good set of criteria. I, I sometimes sit down and say, how are these individuals going to impact my mother and father or would have impact my grandmothers and grandfathers? What kind of policies are going to do that? So there's a gauge that tells me, you know, housing, Medicare, those kinds of things. How will these policies impact those people who have less of a voice? Now, I got out and voted last Monday as an early vote. Are you uh, setting a good example for your students? Have you been to the polls yet? I'll, I'll get there soon, sometime this week. As soon as I find a little bit of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there early. I like to get it done early. Although the other thing is I can take my kids if I wait till next Tuesday. Uh -huh. I can take them along and show them what it means to participate in the process. So I'm kind of going back and forth right now, uh, right now on that. Uh, you're talking about our ancestors, Paul. I just think about back to 1880 when the Osages adopted a constitutional form of government for the first time. Within 10 years of, of the, the, the buffalo being gone that had been our, our, yes. sus, our, our sustenance, you know, for generations. And Osages who were not yet literate in English or an Osage in any language, couldn't read, uh, they voted uh, for candidates based on colored strips of paper. 
And uh, when they embraced democracy, they found ways to participate that would allow everybody to take part. And I think that's a profound statement about how, how deep and long many of our communities have been participating in the democratic process and in trying to find ways within this modern world to, to make choices uh, that, that, that come from our community, but also come from our conscience and come from our freedom. Uh, and, and I like to think about those people, my ancestors who embraced democracy that long ago and, and how I'm continuing that Osage tradition even today. Uh, appreciate you joining with us. We got to go now. If there's any bombshells, uh, maybe we'll give you another ring. Otherwise, the, uh, my understanding that people are blowing up inner tubes even in Illinois because of the 25 foot waves they're anticipating <laughs> coming off of Lake Michigan. Wow. Okay. Uh, there, it's hard to we'll 50, 50 mile an hour winds coming into the bay, 25 foot waves down into Chicago. I hope you're a ways from the shoreliner. Yeah, I am. All right. Well, <laughs> see you Thanks, soon. Robert. Thanks, Robert. And that is another roundup of news from Indian Country. On this edition of Native News Update, we want to say P. Nagigi for joining with us and come back again soon.